Hello, welcome everyone to coming together to support high quality P3 teacher preparation in California. Hosted by the Learning Policy Institute and co-sponsored by California Community College Early Childhood Educators, TRI-CECE, California County Superintendents Educational Services Association, CSESA, California Council on Teacher Education, CCTE, and PEACH which is an early childhood higher education collaborative. Thank you co-sponsors for coming together with us so quickly and with such a collaborative spirit. You can find links to all these organizations in the resource padlet. Uh, this convening is supported by funding from the Balmer Group, Heising Simons Foundation, David and Lucille Packard Foundation, and the Silver Giving Foundation. Thank you so much to our funders. Next slide, please. Here's a quick look at our agenda for the day. If you click on the link in the chat, you can see a more detailed agenda with speaker's name. Um, but we'll hear from Linda Darling-Hammond, Phyllis Jacobson and Amy Rising from CTC, Hannah Melnick from LPI and Sarah Neville Morgan from CDE, as well as representatives from our co-sponsors. After the break, we've planned a great panel and fishbowl for you. And we'll also have breakout time for making connections. Next slide, please. We hope today's event will be a time for shared visioning around how to support high quality, accessible pathways and pipelines to build up the P3 teacher workforce and collective thinking about how such pathways fit into a more coherent system for preparing and supporting early childhood educators. We also hope you'll get a chance to network with potential partners in your own regions and reflect on how the important work you all have already been doing can be amplified through collaborations um, and that you'll walk away with some concrete next steps. So at this time, I'd like to welcome LPI President and CEO and President of the California State Board of Education, Linda Darling-Hammond for introductory remarks. Thank you so much, Kathy. So it's great to see everybody here today. Uh, this is really a, an historic occasion. Uh, and uh, I guess we could go to the next slide. We're going to work together to uh, develop our shared vision for this uh, new era in California history uh, around uh, building a new early childhood education ecosystem and environment. Uh, we all know about the importance of high quality early childhood education. Uh, and California has embarked on this agenda with both universal TK, um, investments in childcare and uh, in preschool, uh, a new early childhood credential, uh, and um, the investment in a new um, set of opportunities for the workforce. Uh, it's a big change from a couple of years ago. Uh, and across the country, people have been taking up this agenda. Uh, we did a report a few years ago called Untangling the Evidence on Preschool Effectiveness, because as these programs have cropped up across the states, there's been evidence from some states that they are getting uh, the kind of um, uh, outcomes for children that they had hoped to from the early studies of a high quality preschool. Uh, and in some other states, the outcomes have been more mixed. Uh, and we want to be sure that in California, we really lean in to what we know about high quality programs, the importance of well-qualified teachers, the importance of uh, child ratios that are um, small enough and um, personalized enough, the importance of early childhood programming uh, that allows children to learn in developmentally appropriate ways. I'll just take one second to note uh, in this um, report that we did a couple of years ago that uh, one of the things we found is that uh, not only is the uh, evidence very strong and consistent in, in most studies about the value of early childhood education, but even in places uh, where there were mixed results as in Tennessee's study, which has been much talked about, uh, what you saw was that uh, kids who got uh, preschool education uh, were uh, decidedly better prepared 
than those who did not in, uh, receive preschool education. And even in the later years uh, where they followed students and there was some um, question about whether the results uh, held up, uh, when you compared students who were equivalent across the comparison groups, uh, the evidence was very strong that preschool had made a difference. And when you compared young people who had had uh, preschool with those who had not, the differences were even larger. So uh, it's important that we also uh, engage in the research that will document what we're learning, that we engage in the practices that have been shown to be effective, uh, and that we do that in a collaborative way. So I'm delighted that there's so many of uh, the members of this community uh, here in this uh, webinar today. Next slide. Uh, the investment in uh, California early childhood education, if you can press the cursor again, is really uh, enormous. <laughs> $2.7 billion uh, will have been invested over the next four years for universal TK, just for the support for enrollments uh, of children. Plus, we have expanded funding for preschool and childcare. And in addition, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that we have a variety of very important investments in the P3 workforce, in the early childhood workforce. And those are important for us both to take advantage of and build upon uh, and to use to ensure that the large number of teachers who need to be recruited into this enterprise uh, are recruited and retained uh, and supported in ways that are uh, productive both intellectually in their learning uh, and financially in their pocketbooks. There is a whole set of teacher pathway, pro whoops, thank you, a whole set of teacher pathway programs. Uh, we earlier uh, put in place resources for teacher residency programs, uh, and those have been, those resources have been added to, and uh, early childhood educators have been explicitly identified as uh, able to access teacher residency programs, and we hope many, many districts in partnership with higher education institutions will be uh, building uh, TK um, residency pipelines. Uh, those come with $20,000 per resident matched by the district uh, and can also incorporate uh, scholarship funding uh, from the Golden State Teacher Grants. There's a classified school employee credentialing program also open now to early childhood educators. Uh, the legislature has just this uh, last week put $200 million into dual enrollment programs that will allow young people who are in career pathways starting in high school uh, to take courses in community colleges and colleges that can count towards their preparation and in the case of early childhood can help them get ready for um, graduating with a child development uh, assistant teacher permit, uh, begin the pipeline and build upon that uh, eventually to come into the lead teacher workforce. We have a half a billion dollars going into Golden State Pathway programs that will help high schools uh, develop pathways into fields including education and teaching uh, with special emphasis on early childhood. Uh, an integrated teacher education program um, that will, through the Teacher Credentialing Commission, issue grants to higher education institutions to begin to create new credentialing programs or to expand the ones that they have. Some of those will be two plus two models with community colleges uh, on a hopefully streamlined pathway. I mentioned that candidates are able to get Golden State teacher grants of up to $25,000 a piece to underwrite their preparation uh, on their en route to the, the profession. And then there are a whole set of grants that have been put online for funding for professional learning. Uh, there is training for principals uh, in early how to be a good leader of a elementary school that includes an early childhood TK program through the 21st century uh, California School Leadership Academy. There is a funding coming online for early literacy coaching. An early math initiative continues. Uh, educator effectiveness block grants will be open to early childhood educators. Uh, and then we have flexible 
grants for universal pre-K from the Department of Education for planning and implementation. Uh, and we hope that everyone will be taking advantage of these resources as they build the path to the future. Next slide. <clears throat> so our vision for the early childhood workforce, which began in the master plan for early learning and care, uh, is really to create uh, streamlined pathways uh, that enhance educator competencies at each juncture so that they can both support child development and learning uh, in their current roles and so that they can progress uh, through uh, uh, the roles of assistant to associate to lead teacher um, and to be prepared to do that en route to an early childhood credential. We hope that that creates a developmental understanding of early childhood through um, grade three instruction so that we have alignment uh, and support for children at every step along that pathway. That also takes into account the fact that we want a uh, an environment for children that supports multilingualism, that supports inclusion, uh, and that supports uh, a joyful, developmentally appropriate learning uh, context for them. Uh, we do want to incentivize and fund these career pathways I mentioned, and to implement uh, supportive program standards that uh, are accompanied, we hope, by the kind of coaching and mentoring that allows every program to be in a process of continual improvement. Next slide. I'm going to pass the ball now to Hannah, I think. Thanks, Linda. Um, so we're next going to um, go to um, Phyllis and Amy Rising, who are going to be speaking on behalf of the California Commission for Teacher Credentialing. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you, Linda, for that introduction, and uh, great to be here with all of you today. So if we could go to our first slide, that would be helpful. And next slide. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So uh, welcome again to all of you, and we're happy to be here today to share information. Let's go to the next slide. So a little policy uh, to add to Linda's pol policy context that she shared. The commission is, of course, developing a PK to three early childhood education specialist credential that will serve as a bridge for the current workforce, as well as credential teachers who need to earn 24 units of ECE, CD, child development coursework for apportionment purposes. The work is originated in the uh, transforming the workforce birth to eight report that came out in 2015. So we have been in discussion around this work for many years to accomplish this vision. The PK to three early childhood specialist credential is needed with bridges to this credential available for those with the ECE center based experience and those multiple subject credential holders who would like to earn this retooled PK to three credential. And finally, the PK to three specialist credential requirements will be as rigorous as those for the multiple subject credential with equivalency options available of course, to recognize and value those prior experiences of the working, those, those educators working in center-based programs. So let's go on to the next slide. So some of you may be wondering what is the PK-3 to specialist credential? So just to review, the PK-3 to specialist credential refocuses and repurposes the existing ECE specialist credential and promotes developmentally, culturally, and linguistically appropriate practices in grades PK to three. The credential is designed specifically to ensure developmentally appropriate practices across the continuum of the grades PK to three, and it also maintains the K to three curriculum, an important note there. Finally, the specialist credential has parallel rigor and requirements, as I mentioned before, to the multiple subject credential. Uh, many pathways are being designed to recognize and value that experience and the expertise of those teachers who currently hold a child development permit or have other center-based preschool teaching experiences at the teacher or higher level permit. 
We wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of the current status of the work. So we have uh, several draft components that have been developed and shared with the field over the last many months. We have a draft authorization statement that has been shared. We have credential requirements, draft teaching performance expectations or TPEs that define the job role of the PK to three ECE specialist credential teacher. And finally, we also have shared program standards for the quality and effectiveness of preparation programs. More information at a higher level of detail is provided around these um, developed documents in the June 2022 commission meeting items, 3A and 3B, and the link there will take you to those items if you would like further information. We also wanna point out what is still under development. So we can go to the next slide. We are still in the process of working through with a design team of early childhood experts, a performance assessment. Um, and it's currently being pilot tested this spring and we are beginning to see that information come in and we are starting to really deeply study what we're seeing in this pilot test. And then in addition to the performance assessment, we're also, uh, we have our reading instruction competency assessment, RECA, and pursuant to SB 488, work is currently in progress. We're working with a literacy performance work group right now to think through new literacy, uh, a new literacy performance assessment um, that's coming. But in the work group now, we're looking at teaching performance expectations and things like that program standards around literacy. Um, and we do expect that performance assessment to be online by 2025 uh, that looks at and allows teacher candidates to demonstrate their capacity to to teach literacy. And with that, I'm gonna turn it to my colleague, Phyllis Jacobson, who's gonna take us through the next few slides. Phyllis. Thank you, Amy, and good afternoon, everyone. So the key requirements for earning the proposed PK3 specialist credential are these. A bachelor's or higher degree, a basic skills requirement, which would be met by those holding a bachelor's degree, a subject matter competency, but in this instance, it would be focusing specifically on early childhood education and child development, along with the K-3 curriculum and standards, and the programs currently in the field uh, now that people are ex have been completing for a child development permit would also apply to that. A teacher preparation program that would include 600 hours of clinical practice across the spectrum of both PK and TK, as well as K-3, and the passage of an applicable TPA that Amy was just talking to you about. And then passing the RECA, the Reading Instruction Competency Assessment, until such time as the new literacy performance assessment uh, is available and in place. Next slide, please. So we did talk about this as a bridge credential. So it's a bridge for those educators in early childhood who already have a bachelor's degree and preschool experience. And we're going to provide ways by equivalency where those who have prior preparation and experience uh, teaching in pre-K can use that towards meeting the requirements for this credential. And this is done through the teacher preparation programs that have experience in understanding how to look at prior transcripts and prior experience and translating those into credit. And then we have a bridge for credential teachers uh, along with a pathway to meet the 24 ECE unit requirement for the apportionment purposes. And they too will be able to apply prior coursework they may have already taken, as well as completing some additional units if they need it towards earning this credential. Next slide, please. We do wanna let you know that we have had extensive public comment opportunities. I'm not going to read this slide to you, but just know, and the references are within the slide, how many people participated. Uh, we've had design teams, we've had credentialing work groups, we've had a number of public input surveys, We've had a lot of public input, uh, virtual focus groups, and thank you, Renee, for uh, op offering to assist us with those. We've had a number of presentations, discussions, and other interactions with the field, and we thank the field for inviting us to participate with you in these discussions. We hold ECE office hours twice a month. This is available online uh, between noon and 1 p.m., the first and third Tuesdays of the month where you can engage with us with any questions you might have or comments you might want us to, to hear. We have a monthly ECE news update you can subscribe to. And then we, of course, always welcome public comment and input at our commission meetings. And with that, back to Amy. 
Thanks, Phyllis. So we did want to talk about next steps and the commission direction at the recent June 2022 meeting. So the commission endorsed the proposed PK to three early childhood specialist authorization statement, the proposed credential requirements and the draft TPEs and the draft program standards. Staff will continue to review all of the feedback that was received at the June 2022 commission meeting and will be bringing back revised sets of all four components at the August commission meeting. So we invite you to join us at our August meeting. Staff are working on developing draft enabling regulations for the PK to three specialist credential uh, for the commission's consideration at the August meeting. And finally, technical assistance will begin for program sponsors who are interested in developing um, a PK to three ECE specialist credential uh, given the outcome of the August commission meeting. And with that, I'll turn it back to Phyllis who's just gonna talk about a few more ways that you can stay in touch with us as we continue our work together with all of you. Thanks, Phyllis. Yes, we do want you all to know there are multiple ways to interact with us on a continual basis and to, to stay informed. Uh, we've given you links here through the slides that you can subscribe or unsubscribe to a number of um, information vehicles at, at your own discretion. And you can contact us directly via email. And we also maintain an ECE webpage that contains links to further resources. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Renee Marshall. Thank you so much, Phyllis. And I just have to give a plug. The PSD newsletter is one of my favorite things of Friday. It comes out every Friday and I look through every little piece of it and I encourage others to too. There's so many golden nuggets within that one piece of communication that comes out from CDC. So thank you so much to Amy and Phyllis and your team for producing that. Hello everybody, Renee Marshall here. I'm a consultant with Learning Policy Institute right now for this event. So excited to be here together in this space. We're here for many reasons. One of the hugest reasons though is to hear voice and perspective and most importantly, your expertise. I have to stop for a minute and just all of us reflect on the fact that it is Thursday, June 30th. We are in the middle of summer, which for many of you, you're supposed to be off right now. And at this minute, 313 of us are sitting in a collaborative space as we move forward in a new time in education. So thank you so much for being here. Um, and I'm excited for this next part. We're going to actually have a poll going on. So if we could get that going. and. Um, if you could take a minute to look at it, start answering. I'm going to actually hand it over right now to Laurel from Tri-CECE ECE to, to talk about this poll and to, to work with everybody a little bit on the results. So right now, please go ahead and look at the questions, start answering it. And Laurel, I'll hand it to you. Thank you so much. I want to give everyone a minute just to read through these questions. Please go ahead and uh, feel free to answer however you wish. The first question, how informed do you feel about the PK3 credential? Um, one being, I know nothing about this credential, and three being, I'm following this very closely. Question two is, how do you feel about the PK3 credential? One is, I'm concerned, and three is, I'm excited. And question number three is, why are you here today? Please select um, it's multiple choice, as many that apply to you, uh, to learn the most up-to-date information, to network with other PK3 credential stakeholders, to hear about what others are doing to support the PK3 credential, and or maybe a colleague has suggested that you attend today. So again, as you're filling out the, that poll, we just want to reiterate that this is, um, we've come together, it's in the middle of summer, you're really showing your commitment to supporting ECE and finding out and making sure that we are doing what is in the best interest of children. Um, I think that's that's what brings us all here together. Um, we, we're we gonna work together in partnerships and I, I firmly believe that that's how we are going to help shape this credential is by doing it together. Um, we don't wanna have send something out and then look back and go, oh, well, we didn't have all of these different voices. Everyone's voice here matters. Um, and so we're going to continue to do that today. We're going to build on this shared language and shared vision, as well as an opportunity to really connect with each other and, um, and see where we go from here, how we move forward. So it looks like, um, Let's go ahead and see. It looks like there are about 57%, uh, probably the majority, uh, still have some things uh, to learn about the PK3 credential. And that's great because you're going to um, learn about that today. 
it's kind of evenly split on uh, our feelings about the PK3 credential. Uh, more than a third of us are very concerned and more than a, almost half of us are excited. And so hopefully that excitement um, is also mirrored with you know, wanting to, you know, that hopefulness of, of what is best and coming together with this. And I think that's, that's really what this is about. And why are we here today? There's um, a number of different reasons and I'll let you all kind of read through that yourselves, but I will go ahead and pass it back to Hannah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laurel, um, and to all of our co-sponsors for joining us today. Um, I'm Hannah Melnick, Senior Policy Advisor at the Learning Policy Institute, where I co-lead our early childhood team. And today I'm going to be presenting from a report that I just co-wrote with my colleagues, Emma Garcia and Melanie Lung, uh, specifically on the projected demand for TK lead and assistant teachers across California and implications for scaling the workforce, drawing from a case study we have uh, recently conducted in New Jersey's preschool expansion. Next slide. So first, I just want to clarify the timeline for expansion. TK is going to become universal by 2025-26, just four years from now, with gradually expanding age eligibility. Um, and at the same time, we're adding new ratio requirements. So whereas where you could technically have as many as 31 children per adult, um, next year there's going to be no more than 12 children per adult and, and uh, no more than 10 per, per child um, or 10 children per adult in subsequent years if funding is appropriated. Um, so next slide. That means that we are going to have to really, we're going to very quickly expand the number of children who are age eligible for TK. Um, we expect that nearly half a million children are going to be eligible for TK by 2025-26. Now, it will still be voluntary, and parents will continue to have the choice to send their child to other preschools, including state preschool and Head Start if they choose. Um, next slide. But so given that uncertainty, we projected a range of uh, estimates for how many children will enroll. From a lower bound of 65% of children enrolling, that dark blue line, to an upper bound of 80% 80 of eligible children, that yellow line, by full implementation. And just for reference, pre-pandemic, we had about 71% of children enrolling in TK if they were age eligible. Next slide. So to serve this TK enrollment, we're going to really need to uh, ramp up the size of our early learning workforce. Um, and that's why we're here today to talk about how we're going to do that. Um, we're going to need between 11,900 and 15,600 teachers um, by full implementation is what we project. And we're assuming that there are about um, uh, 4,100 teachers currently in the TK workforce. So we additionally project that they're going, going to need even more assistant TK teachers than lead teachers, because right now many districts don't employ any um, assistant teachers at all since they're not required. Next. So just want to back up a little bit. We heard a little bit about the preschool, the third grade credential, but what's required right now? Um, for assistant teachers, you need to have a high school degree. If you're in a Title I school, um, you need to meet paraprofessional requirements. So that means you need to have um, some college or um, at least pass a, a basic skills assessment. Now, to be a lead TK teacher, you currently need a bachelor's degree, a multiple subject credential, plus 24 units of early childhood, a child development teacher permit, or equivalent experience by August of 2023. Next. Um, but as um, Amy and Phyllis were describing, we might, teachers, our candidates might be able to meet those requirements with a preschool to third grade ECE specialist credential as soon as next year. And that credential will be a really important bridge for early childhood teachers into TK, which is key because we can see in the data that we're just not producing close to enough multiple subject credential teachers right now to meet the coming demand. Next slide. We do, however, really have a lot of early childhood education educators in the state who are poised to earn a credential. We have 41,000 uh, 41, early educators with a bachelor's degree. Um, th that's about half of those um, teachers statewide, even though a degree is not required. And that's from the Center for the Study of Child Care Employment data. Um, and we also know that um, 29,000 of them hold, or more or less hold a child development teacher permit as well. 
Um, so we also, of course, know that the early childhood workforce is diverse. Um, we have about 66% of center-based ECE teachers are people of color compared to 39% in TK to 12. Um, and we finally, this is, I'm sure everyone is keenly aware that um, the ECE teachers earn significantly less than TK to 12 teachers, about half of the salary on average, meaning that TK is gonna be a very attractive position for early childhood teachers. And empowering these teachers who are primarily women of color to earn higher salaries and um, better working conditions through TK is an equity issue. Um, the higher compensation is also an opportunity to increase the retention of our preschool teachers throughout the state, given high rates of turnover in early childhood. And I just want to flag that the, the recent budget that was just released adds a provision that will temporarily allow early childhood teachers with a BA and child development teacher permit to teach in TK um, under certain conditions. And it's therefore going to be really important that we are ensuring pipelines of teachers, not just into TK, but into all early childhood teaching positions, since there will be movement um, of teachers across fields. And we want to ensure the stability of all of our programs. Next slide. So that brings us to the question of how California will meet the need for so many early educators uh, in short order and how we build up the P to P3 workforce. Um, I'm going to share some lessons from other states from our recent uh, LPI research and specifically from New Jersey. Next. Um, first, just want to point out that California is not alone in developing a P to three credential. Most states, that's nearly two thirds, the ones in red, have um, a P to three credential or something similar. And all the grade, though the grade span varies, most states have an overlapping early or elementary grade credential, like California is likely to. Um, so, next slide. One state we looked at closely is New Jersey because uh, New Jersey faced a really similar situation to California in the early 2000s when they made their preschool program universal in 31 of their lowest income school districts to meet the requirements of a court order. And part of that court decision was requiring that all preschool teachers suddenly have a bachelor's degree and a P to three credential. And as you can see in this chart, they did made, make that happen. They went from 38% to 97% of their teachers meeting the bachelor's and credentials uh, requirement in just six years. And what's more is New Jersey kept a large portion of its diverse early educator um, workforce in preschool with a program that's been shown to have lasting benefits for children. So next slide is I'm gonna show some of the ways that um, they made this happen. Um, first, the New Jersey teacher credentialing body collaborated with higher education institutions to rapidly create new P to three programs. Um, they developed multiple pathways to a credential, including um, traditional four-year bachelor's programs, a master's for folks who had uh, a credential but didn't have the early childhood units, and an alternate route for working um, preschool teachers who are also taking classes at the same time, similar to our internship programs. And this work was facilitated by new state grants for um, higher education capacity building, for programs to hire new faculty and create new programs. We estimate the state spent about $250,000 in dollars um, per university in today's dollars. Next slide. And New Jersey also um, offered investments in P to three teacher candidates, including scholarships that covered pretty much the full cost of tuition um, and supports for working students like career advising, academic tutoring that were offered by IHEs and substitute teachers um, offered at school districts for those who are working while studying. Um, we also, the Credential Commission also worked with institutions of higher education to offer remote courses in areas that didn't have a credentialing um, program nearby. And finally, they mandated district coaching and professional learning for teachers. Um, so I want to just point out that California has several of these investments in place already, as Linda pointed out at the top of the hour. Um, and Amy and Phyllis have talked about. So there's the developing P to three credential. There are multiple pathways to a credential and funding for residencies, internship programs, um, four-year integrated teacher programs, um, and also several capacity building grants that can be used for scholarships and student supports 
Um, some that can be used for higher education, although more funding for developing PETA 3 programs is still needed, as I'm sure we'll be discussing today. And that's why we have to work together with LEAs, philanthropy, and policymakers to make that happen. Um, but it's going to take a huge effort uh, to bring all these pieces together. And that's the endeavor that we're going to be starting in on today. Um, so that's something we'll be discussing in our breakout rooms. I'm going to have um, pass it now to Renee who's gonna read, lead us into those breakout rooms um, for further discussion of our vision for the early childhood workforce. Thank you so much, Hannah. And to everybody who's on, this is the moment that the producer of the, of the event, we're all gonna hold our breath because we are so excited about breakout groups, but it's also, we have 316 of us. So um, could we go to the slide, please? Um, we are gonna be splitting up by regions. And so it's really important to take a glance at this map right now. The idea is for these regional discussions, these opportunities to meet other people, other potential partners in your region. And so um, please be checking out and see where you're located if you have any trouble. And when we go and into the breakout, if you um, are not sure exactly where you're supposed to go, please feel free to, to stay back with us. We're also going to please ask, we're asking and hoping that each breakout group is going to max at about 12 to 15 people please do not go over like 20, um, actually 15. If you could stay at 15 or less, that would be great. And in that situation, like say you're in a region that's got two breakouts and one room has 15 or 20 and the other room has four, if you could personally move yourself over, um, that would be great. If not, we may be moving some people over just to try to balance each of the regions. So um, please make sure you check out everything on the map there and make sure you know where you're going. And then um, max 20 people per room, worst case scenario, ideally better to stay at that 12 to 15 range. And we're really gonna get into some deep conversation here. We'll be stopping the recording at this point, but we'll be taking notes and recording what's said in each of the, um, in each of the breakout sessions because we wanna make sure to capture your voice. Um, so with that, um, Nicole. Wonderful. We have 64 back so far to the main room. So we're going to probably wait another minute or two to the rest of our breakouts. Come back and join us. It's been a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here and for your patience as we're climbing in numbers, all coming back together. Oh, we're over at over 250 of us right at this moment. So wonderful. Um, uh, we're going to just wait another moment till, till we have um, everybody or as much of as much of everybody. Renee, can you put me back in my group? Um, we're actually going to come back together whole group right now, and then we're going to do a breakout, a second breakout later in the day. But I mean, I'm the facilitator. Oh, yes, yes. You will go back to your group as the facilitator. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I'm, ele I'm 11. B. Excellent. Yeah, yes. Actually, I, the same thing happened to me, Adora Fisher. I was removed from the group and I'm region five. Yeah, and everyone was, was removed. I too, yes, I was we were, we're, Yeah, we were all brought back. Yep. The we are breakout. about to start the whole group share out. So everyone should be here. You're in the right place. So it would be nice if you could um, provide like warnings in the group that you're going to be leaving instead oh. of just getting kicked out because we all just got oh. kicked out with no it should warning. Have, it should have given a, it should have but given a 29 there were, second. There, there, were, there were warnings. There, there were warnings. No, no there was. There was a one minute warning, but three seconds later we were kicked out. You know what's yeah. interesting is somebody else got, there's a couple, there was a little discrepancy there with technology. We're just so pleased that everybody's back here now together. So I'm so sorry for that. And hopefully with our second set of um, breakouts, we can ensure that doesn't happen. We will try our best, but um, we're Renee, going to- Renee, yes. Yes. Renee, I think what happened, we who were group two did get our pretty much a minute they were group 11. I think it went kind of by when the group were, um, when they got there. So that's why like Jan and Denise got less time. I chose to be where I lived and not where I worked. So I bet that's what happened. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Well, sorry that for the little bit of uh, disequilibrium there, everybody, we really appreciate you coming back. And for those of you who got, you know, move to different spaces. Sorry about that. Thank you so much for um, just coming back and being together and being patient with the technology side of this. Um, you'd think a couple years into this pandemic, we would have it 100%, but it, there's still so many things to learn with the technology. So thank you for your patience. I'm really excited to look at the vision Padlet and um, to see what we're doing and to see what everybody's talking about and just the, the themes that are coming through in our session today. Um, and 
I hope everybody has had a chance to, to, to check it out. I'm really excited for the next person who's going to talk for us a bit about this. And so I'm going to hand it over to um, Jan Fish to share about kind of these different emerging things that came out from Breakout One. Thank you so very much, Renee. Uh, first of all, I, I know that in our breakout, there was a lot of uh, concern and uh, desire for more information from the field, from teachers, from administrators to both uh, support ECE teachers and also make sure that there are really accessible pathways. Uh, Peach, has worked for uh, many years to, for over 12 years now with higher ed faculty and uh, across AABA masters and credential programs. The other concerns of, the, um, of our working group, I'm kind of toggling Renee because I thought I had three minutes to talk about Peach and I'm was sorry, wondering, I yeah, how I am I supposed to uh, summarize what I only had experience of 11C, right? I, I, I'm sorry for that, uh, Jan. Please feel free to focus on Peach. I'm looking at the reoccur the themes that are coming out in the Padlet, and things are even emerging oh. right now. And what you started out with okay. the clear communication and questions that people have from the field was spot on. Please feel free to go okay. directly to Peach. Thank you. Okay, fine. Thank you very much for the refocus. Um, okay, and in Peach, what we've done, really, the success of the already strong collaboration in the field has been the growth of articulation of courses between two-year and four-year programs, the working with two-year and four-year programs in child development, in early childhood, and recognizing and acknowledging that ECE and child development are a professional discipline and a field of practice that is research-based and evidence-based. And this led to CTC's identification of child development, early childhood subject matter competency is central to this P3 Good. credential. Amen. As such, Amen. As Yes, as such, the baccalaureate in child development and early childhood must be the pathway of choice among multiple pathways. Also, accessibility, we want to work uh, to further collaborate with two plus two plus one models or four plus one models and with our teacher credential programs and local LEAs and eliminate barriers to early childhood child development baccalaureate grads accessibility to teacher credentialing programs with tests required, et cetera. I think that the ECE work group at CTC has clearly put the stamp on the need for an increased um, equity, diversity, and inclusion emphasis in this credential by adding a new seventh standard for this credential. And uh, looking ahead, working with teacher education programs, that is going to be our really dynamic community of practice crucible to make sure that early childhood child development is straight across as we have participated too in the California team of the Transforming the Workforce Birth to Eight and co-leading the higher ed group for that, uh, that state plan and reaching out to see that that accessibility for the student and that student's voice in child development expertise and the child development discipline is clearly there at the two year where it is, four year where it is, masters where it is, and, uh, in, and the opportunity to put that together and reconfigure the K3 part together 
with teacher education programs in the credential area. Thank you so very much. We're very excited for this future collaboration based on ECECD subject matter competency. Thank you so much, Jan. Now we're gonna hear from Karen Escalante from CCTE to also share some perspective. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Jan. Welcome everyone. I'm Karen Escalante, president-elect of CCTE, which is the California Council on Teacher Education. We are the largest and most comprehensive form, um, forum for teacher education programs in our state. We represent almost every single teacher education program in the state of California. And one of the things that I want to talk about, and I echo, you know, Jan, Jan's um, excitement. Um, I do apologize. I'm on day eight of COVID, so I do not have her level of energy at this moment. Aww. But Aww. I do want to talk about the fact that, um, you know, we in, in teacher education, we do need to be breaking down these silos. In my group, we talked about the need that um, community colleges will now be implementing teaching performance expectations within their syllabi, within their courses, and that's not something that they've done before. Those in teacher preparation, um, thank you, Kathleen, those in teacher preparation have that experience. So all the more reason we need to be in this space working together to ensure that our community college partners understand how to do that. And then moving beyond um, teacher education, we also make, need to make sure that induction is prepared to support our P through three credentials as well. So it is a continuum. Um, and that's something I think we always need to remember. It is a continuum and we need to ensure that however, however the chips fall and however this comes into play, we need to ensure that there's support across and throughout the continuum for our early childhood um, credential candidates. So um, I, in, in the interest of time, I will pass it back to Renee. Thank Thank you, Renee. Thank you so much. And I want to give a huge thanks um, to everybody who contributed their thoughts to the vision Padlet. Um, over the course of this day, we're going to have a variety of Padlets that we're going to be kind of engaging with and pulling information from. And just the first vision Padlet, I hope everybody takes a few minutes to go back and look at that. Um, just to and, and even add to it as well. So with this, now we're going to be um, going out for a break for a few minutes. Um, I want to check with the LPI team to see exactly how many minutes we're going to take on this. I know we were slightly over, so I want to see if we're still good going for eight minutes. Is that good for, for the LPI team? I believe we will okay. come back at 2.13. 2.13. Okay, five minutes. So everybody, let's take a five-minute break, please. And we look forward to seeing you back in just a few minutes. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, welcome back. I think we're going to have Renee um, is going to uh, come on next to introduce Sarah Neville Morgan. Thank you so much. Um, it's really exciting to be back. I hope everybody had a good few minutes just to relax there and decompress. I know this is a lot of information. We appreciate everybody staying together. Um, we still have 273 of us here today, which is so exciting. And um, our next speaker is somebody who um, one of my favorite people to listen to and to learn from. And so I'm excited to say that um, next we have Sarah Neville Morgan coming to join us from the California Department of Education. Thank you so much, Sarah, for being here today. Thanks, Renee. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a few big things that have been happening across California, starting with transforming our schools. So I'm hoping our slides catch up. Um, there's, there it is. So that's the one with um, Tony Thurmond. It's the next slide. And really showing that all of these historic budget investments that were started in last year's budget and are continuing on with even additional investments uh, to go past historic and do a double historic this year, create an opportunity to have a school system that really knits together a variety of things, starting with UPK and the expansion of transitional kindergarten as well as our state preschool program, but universal meals, looking at expanded learning opportunities program, um, community schools, more funds for special ed, and that there is really an integrated nature around all of these programs and services. And it allows California to take advantage of this and create the educational system that our students and families need in 2020 and beyond, not the system from 1920 or 1950 or even 
from 2019, but really what we need moving forward as we reimagine and rethink all of this, one that truly brings equity to our students and families, and also provides a lot more opportunities for teachers and those interested in becoming teachers, if you think back to Linda's slides in the beginning. Next slide, please. So defining universal pre-K, I saw a couple questions in the chat earlier about this and want to say that UPK stands for Universal Pre-Kindergarten, which by 2025-26 will exist for all four-year-old children in California. In California, UPK is a mixed delivery system that brings together programs across early learning and K-12, relying heavily on a expansion of TK to become Universal TK, as well as the California State Preschool Program, but also requires partnerships with Head Start, community-based organizations, private preschool, and the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program to ensure that every four-year-old child, regardless of background, race, zip code, immigration status, or income level, has access to quality learning experiences the year before kindergarten. Next slide, please. As a foundation for Pre-K, we really think of it within a P3 alignment here at, at CDE and in partnership with CTC. So this graphic helps show how we put all of those pieces together. TK or UTK is the integral program and in that, the one that it will really be serving all four-year-olds who want to enroll by 2025-26. It is truly the only one that is fully universal and funded for everyone. The UPK is the next part above that, and so it partners with TK, but goes beyond that, as I said, with our state preschool program, as well as other partners. So our state preschool program serves kids three and four year olds, so actually two years, nine months, and has a variety of eligibility factors. But in the budget, we're seeing more and more expansion in that so that we will see greater diversity. I just got muted, so I unmuted myself. We can As hear well. you now, Sarah. <laughs> okay, good. I got a little, we are muting you sign. As well as other funds to expand supporting children with disabilities so that it becomes more and more of a program supporting our littles with disabilities and becomes more inclusive. And then going up to that P3 piece where we really look at alignment from UPK, like from state preschool and Head Start into TK, into K, into first, second, and third, and having that overarching connection that really is highlighted in a lot of research currently as, as how we think about UPK implementation as part of that broader frame. So we make sure there's alignment around best practices, assessments, curriculum, professional development, and all of those pieces so that children have a very coherent experience. Next slide, please. We do have some short-term goals that we're really looking at within our P3 frame. And as we work with partners across the state with our design teams, we have a state leadership table. We have a UPK P3 kitchen cabinet that Linda is actually our, our lead for. Um, looking at that, we've created a results count focus. And in that results count focus are looking at some long-term outcomes of of an, a stronger and more diverse UPK system with engaged partners from all relevant se sectors and have that workforce and development part as a key part with seven short-term outcomes related to that. So making sure that we have more qualified UPK teachers and assistant teachers with a deep focus for us on TK and state preschool, making sure that our teachers reflect California's linguistic and racial and ethnic diversity that we have more CSPP teachers who hold a child development teacher level permit or higher. Right now, we still have quite a few at the assistant level, making sure that UPK teachers are accessing pathways to advance from early learning and care and expanded learning fields so that they can go up, out, but have a variety of pathways, making sure that we have retention and stability in the field and looking at developmentally informed instruction that's really aligned with the Preschool Learning Foundation we are currently updating those preschool learning foundations to take a deeper dive into equity. So more around both race, um, culture, language, as well as inclusion of children with disabilities in all of those and a frame so that we go up from the preschool age up into those early grades as well. And then looking at our expanded learning opportunities program staff and making sure that they have 
appropriate child development and ECE knowledge as well as they start with more and more young children. And then our last one is really how all of this takes everybody. So it's a collective piece and we're really looking to identify and share goals and our collective actions to do all of those specifically across some state agencies. So CDE and CTC are doing quite a few partnerships in this space and sort of locked arms as we implement UPK and P3. But we also have Department of Finance in there, Governor's Office and the State Board of Education. A lot of policy leadership and organizations. So partnering outside us as we look at the UPK planning and implementation. So supporting school districts, county offices of ed, our state preschool programs, Head Start, um, r &Rs, the local plan child care planning councils, and our higher ed partners as we really come together to do all of this work, identify actions, create our action plans, and then measure, report, and hold ourselves accountable for progress. One of the things that we really highlight is right now our state preschool program only serves 13% of all eligible three-year-olds. And one key goal for expansion of UPK is to serve more and more eligible children so that we see more children in California engaged in high quality preschool with those high quality educators engaged with them as part of it. So it takes all of us. We wanna talk about breaking down the silo. So as you get together and collaborate more and more, get some names and join us and work together to really make sure we have the system that's needed today, not the system from 20 years ago or 50 years ago. Back to you, Renee. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much. There's so much discussion also happening in the chat right now, and I would like to encourage everybody to continue that throughout our day together, and we will absolutely be capturing um, any questions or whatnot that are not answered over the course of the day. So please, please, please encourage that conversation, everybody. And um, we are really excited because now we have a fantastic panel presentation. I'd like to hand it over to Sarah from LPI to introduce our participants and tell us a little bit more. Sarah? Thanks, Renee. Um, so I'll start off by uh, introducing our speakers for the panel. Uh, we will be hearing from St Stephanie Siminski, who is the Director of Early Learning and Development at San Diego Unified School District, Pei Ying Wu, who is an Assistant Professor and Fancer Chair at California State University in Fresno, and Kathleen White, who is the lead of the Bay Area Regional Joint Venture. So today we've heard about the urgent need to expand the ECE workforce and how other states have started doing this work. Now we'll hear from experts in California, Stephanie, Pei Ying, and Kathleen, all of who are creating innovative ways to build pipelines and pathways into the workforce. They're at different stages of implementation, from just getting off the ground to years of experience, but they are each taking a creative and collaborative approach to support the profession. For example, using different funding sources to sustain their work. So hopefully you will be inspired by their efforts and identify a concrete next step you can take in your own region. So each speaker will give a brief presentation and then we'll come back together for a discussion. So with that, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Stephanie to kick us off. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you for having me. So um, again, I'm from San Diego Unified and the strength of our program really lies behind that university partnership. And just as I highlighted this quote, there is no universal recipe of implementing a university partnership or a workforce pipeline. Um, so I have, I have highlighted three strategies that, are crit that were critical for us as a district for our implementation plan in San Diego. And so one of the first strategies that we targeted was understanding our, your district needs. And so in terms of staffing, so what projections over time, what retirements, what re, um, retention and retainment of your current staff? What, what about UPK, UTK, kindergarten, special education or dual language? What, what, what is your staffing needs projected over time? Another area was our instructional need. We wanted to provide pathways to learn competencies for high quality learning, but also on that vertical articulation where TK teachers are sending their students to kindergarten and kindergarten teachers know what the TK teachers are doing and vice versa. And also any fiscal needs. What, what um, funding sources are we going to use? What's available? What, and looking ahead at what we could use in the future. 
Another strategy that we used for our, our recipe of implementation was to co-construct our program with a shared vision. And so we, we strive to make it intentional, very purposeful, flexible and differentiated in the design with providing multiple entry points for our entire organization to participate on different pipelines. And then an area that I heard um, people talk about even today was to eliminate barriers. That was very important with us in our partnership with Teach Lead San Diego. We wanted to eliminate the barriers that were um, a part of our employees that we heard from them. We took surveys. And so we provided job embedded options. We have a co-teaching model, which allows an ECE teacher to co-teach with a TK teacher. And so while that uh, ECE teacher is earning their multiple subject credential, they're able to work full time in that classroom with that teacher. Um, we also provide internships and residency. We also, we also targeted job shadowing. And I know that sounds simple, but it has been so worthwhile because a lot of people haven't had the experience of sitting in a kindergarten room or sitting in a bilingual program or sitting in um, an ECE classroom. And we wanted them to have an experience. So when they enter the pipeline or they wanna apply, they know different pathways that, that they're interested in. Also, we wanted our employees to be able to work full time and attend class. We wanted to pro provide scholarships and tuition reimbursement. Uh, as a district, we apply for grants to support the workforce pipeline, and we really want to offer personalized support through each department. So our ultimate goal was to inspire our educators and bring that new research into a formal learning context. So as we partnered with the University of Laverne, we had this ideal state and it became reality. It's becoming reality for us. And so coming to the table with University of Laverne, we, we just dream big. I had every idea in mind. Um, I would bring them ideas, I'd call them with ideas, and then we'd leverage their expertise and we'd collaborate on how to accomplish our goals. If there was a way we could do it, we, we figured it out. And so um, what resulted from that even experience and exchange of ideas is the university um, has me serve as an advisory committee member that leads the practitioner work along with the research. So we together we realized that this isn't a program with a start and an end point. We wanted to build a sustainable program by focusing on cultivating leaders and succession planning rather than just filling a list of job openings. Next slide. So the district believes in a pro we've approached this model through an integrated structure. Um, just like Sarah mentioned, we want to offer a district-wide system of support. It's where it's not just early learning. Um, we work with human resources, inclusion and diversity, labor relations, teacher prep, leadership and learning, finance, and contracts. And it allows us to target the individual needs for implementation because you have MOUs going through the system, you have finance on board, you have different processes that you have to accomplish in a short period of time. And this integrated approach allowed us to create this continuous cycle of development. So with UPK and the launch of UTK, we right now, San Diego Unified has over 3,500 UTK students ready to, or that are enrolled for next school year. And summer, the summer enrollment period hasn't even started. And so we built different specialized cohorts specifically for San Diego and the University of Laverne, where we have classified staff that can participate on a pipeline to earn their ECE permit, their teaching certificate, a multiple subject credential pathway, or, an, or a degree. Um, also certificated teachers earning their TK authorization units and advanced degrees. ECE teachers are earning their multiple subject credential or special education authorization, but also our principals. Principals have the opportunity to participate in robust professional learning from the University of Laverne in partnership with San Diego. They can earn their advanced degree, they can participate as a mentor, and they can actually co-teach with the University of Laverne faculty um, to kind of grow our own system. It's, it's a huge honor to work with the University of Laverne and work together because we know that this work will impact our students, staff, and families across our communities. Thanks, Stephanie. And Thank now you. we'll pass it over to Kathleen. Good afternoon. My name is Kathleen White and I'm coordinating um, what's called a regional joint venture. 
um, which is part of a community college consortium focused on specific um, career sectors. My regional joint venture is located in the San Francisco Bay region, um, a large region. We represent about 20% of the uh, workforce in California and have 28 community colleges housed in our region, 24 of um, which have uh, early childhood or education programs. And so for the past seven years, our um, region, the BACCC has prioritized early childhood and education as a sector and has provided strong workforce funds to develop and build pathways, pipelines, and programs that lead to more students entering, exiting, succeeding, and entering jobs related to this sector. Um, we, in the last year, have prioritized apprenticeship as well as emerging pipelines and pathways. And we're very focused on um, our role in um, how we're uniquely positioned to really contribute and recruit and then place in jobs and transfer uh, the emerging workforce. So right now, the majority of ECE and EDU workforce members in California begin at a California community college. If you think of a, a funnel, we're at the top. Um, we are positioned to uh, support dual enrollment in that um, our dual enrollment students receive free tuition and uh, joint credit. So they get both college and high school credit. So we have unique agreements that incentivize this model um, and allows for early career exploration and completion of very key courses that mean that when they graduate, they're ready to enter a number of entry level positions. Um, we compare the need for immediate jobs with long-term careers. So what Tony had mentioned in our, we had a small group session in our region around, um, you know, just understanding that community college students um, are looking for immediate employment as well as long-term career goals. And we need to satisfy both of those. Um, we focus on grow your own <clears throat> and have really been preaching the grow your own mantra for quite a while. I think it's gaining steam now. Um, both funding, energy, and time in recruitment should be replaced with early identification and support through the pipeline and the pathways. Um, I agree with our last speaker in saying that districts need to know how many folks they hire. And even, I'll take it a step further, they need to know a percentage of their graduating high school class, identify that percentage, which will be needed to satisfy those future jobs, and then make sure that they're doing everything they can to ready them to take jobs in their own districts. Uh, we have to focus, I think, in our region, and um, it's most certainly a purpose at community colleges to focus on the students that are going to stay local, that have already identified attending community college, and more importantly, identifying and focusing on the many students who do not enter higher ed after graduation. Next slide, please. So uh, accomplishments to date, we've created a number of labor market and centers of excellence documents that really focus on the data within the sector um, with our centers of excellence uh, that look at workforce demands, projections, time to fill positions, as well as linking that to current courses and programs. We have a new one coming out in our region in a month, uh, focusing on this sector um, we're hoping to see a little bit of the data related to COVID destabilization and um, are also including some projections. We've, in our uh, regional joint venture, have established community of practices um, and technical assistance workshops. And I warmly welcome all of our SFA region members who are on this um, here with us today. We are quite well represented, so it's good to see them. Um, we've launched Teach for the Bay. We will be offering our third Teach for the Bay this uh, fall, which is a virtual student facing regional conference for students interesting, interested in entering the field. Um, it will be September 29th and 30th, and it's free. And um, our first one had 2,100 students attend. So yes, they are interested in entering. They just need support. 
um, we've developed, um, helped to develop new apprenticeships. Uh, we had our legacy program at Berkeley City College that existed prior, and we now have six more that have come on board with CAI funds. Um, and uh, using our intermediary ESEPs and also individual colleges are taking it on themselves. So great models. Next steps include increasing pre-apprenticeships at school districts and at LEAs to ensure that we have high school students to support um, when they graduate and then targeting parents with young children because that's a great potential workforce. We see parents often at the community college level who are completing their education. Um, as soon as their children get old enough to go to school, they re-engage and uh, very often uh, the work aligns with their beliefs and their schedules and their lives. So um, another key group. So I'll be back to answer questions around challenges and um, some specifics. So thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. And now we'll hear from Peggy. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Peggy Wu from Fresno State University in ECE program. So today I want to talk about uh, the Fresno County Higher ECE Workforce Roundtable, which was emerged from the statewide UPK TK initiative and early education teacher development grant program. And three main partners who initiated this project are the senior director of the early care and education department of the office of Fresno County Superintendent of Schools, the department chair of the child development department uh, of Fresno City College and myself. And our goal, um, and also the goal of the round table is to invite stakeholders in higher ed to discuss uh, universal preschool, universal transitional kindergarten, and explore collaborative opportunities to increase and build capacity of the EC workforce in Fresno County. So the participants in our collaboration include Fresno County um, Superintendent of School, the uh, EC department, and two departments from Fresno State, Child, Devo Child and Family Science Department, and Literacy Early Childhood Bilingual Special Education Department, as well as four community colleges, Fresno City, Clovis Community College, Ridley College, Merced Community College. And we also had a supervisor of preschool and early literacy from a school district. Next slide, please. So uh, accomplishments to date, we hosted the first roundtable meeting on March 31st. And in this meeting, we included many presentations on four topics, universal pre-K, what is UPK, needs of agency school districts, universal uh, pre-kindergarten county-wide planning, updates on pre-K to third grade EC specialist credential, and teacher residency program that will include TK teacher, uh, TK teacher preparation. And after the mini presentations, we have breakout sessions on models and pathways for UPK workforce, course uh, child development ECE versus TK courses, and also current status and futures of practicum. And a padlet was also shared with and contributed by the participants for collecting information and resources on models and pathways for UPK workforce and projects offered by each institution. So our next steps, um, I have to say our work is at initial, level, initial stage and our next steps include uh, scheduling three more roundtable meetings in September, January 2023 and April 2023. And with the upcoming announcement of early education teacher development grant results, we plan to gather UPK plans from different school districts. We also plan to develop a directory or resource containing contact information for colleges, summary of college programming like certificates, degree transfer information, credential offerings, course information, including course bundles, modality, time of the day, links to application, faculty contacts, etc. And uh, we also plan to have video presentations, information sessions regarding college offerings. So hopefully, we can help school district navigate different unit bearing training opportunities. So all the teachers who needs 24 units 
uh, can start right away and um, as we begin the new uh, school year. So that's my short presentation. Well, thank you all for sharing uh, the incredible work you are doing to support the workforce. It was great to hear about what you've been able to accomplish. So for the audience who may be at similar or different stages in their own work, uh, what advice can you share with others on making high quality teacher preparation accessible? And I know we have a lot to share on this question, but I'll ask um, that you keep your responses to two minutes uh, so we have time to hear from everyone on the panel. So Stephanie, why don't we start with you again? Thank you. So my advice to districts um, or organizations just leading this work is um, when I first started, I did lots of research on effective pipelines, on different strategies for effective partnerships, different types of professional developments and platforms, and strong retention strategies for um, recruitment and attaining your teachers. And also another piece of advice is to just dream big, um, have all the ideas that you can and bring them forth to the university to collaborate and see if it's possible because some things that you think may not work, they actually find a, find a way to make it work or you can come up with an exchange of ideas. And I didn't want to have anything stand in the way of my own experience um, of what they could offer and having that conversation and leveraging ideas and also um, one of the things that came out of that exchange of ideas was Laverne did a tuition discount for any San Diego school employee. But in addition, knowing that one of the barriers was the cost of you know, higher education, they extended that tuition discount to family members. And so, I mean, never in my wildest dreams would I think that would happen, but they did that um, through an exchange of ideas um, and something that I had read through current research. So. I dream big and, and bring it forward is my best advice. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Pei Ying. Um, what about from your perspective? So I would say that because we still at very early stage, so I don't see like barriers, but when we uh, started this work, we know that people at different institutions might not be interested in other people's work initially. But we want to have a good representation from different institutions. So we use personal connections of three of us pull our contacts. And we have to make sure the agenda for our first meeting actually ignite people's interest, their curiosity. And that's why we include many presentations to set the context and purpose as foundations. And we encourage uh, the participant to share how they could play a role and what they could contribute to our collective efforts. And after the meeting, we debrief to find what people are interested um, in discussing in the future. So uh, we realized that we need to identify critical topics to have productive conversation to reach our goals. So those are uh, my experience. Thank you. And Kathleen? Um, I would say that from my perspective at the community college level, community colleges have, um, many of them, have lower levels of institutional capacity to allow for faculty, staff, and administrators to plan, to uh, collaborate, to fundraise, just because of the structure and demands of uh, the community college. There, We really need time and support. Um, to be part of this conversation, we need a formalized seat at the table um, to discuss the needs of our students and to advocate for our students. And our students represent not only future P3 credential applicants, but they represent the um, individuals that will be staffing um, backfilling TK positions, staffing CDSS programs, um, exempt care programs, caring for children in a range of settings, ranging from nannies to FFNs to family child care, um, staffing out of school time programs, um, and really looking at the whole continuum of the workforce. That, that's our responsibility. That is, is who is sitting in our classrooms. And so we have to look at the entire um, workforce of people who wanna work with children from the really zero to 18 and uh, including children with special needs, um, English language learners, and really look at how we support these students who wanna enter different careers um, 
and themselves have unique challenges. How do we support them all and move them through that top of the funnel into the P3 credential? So I think it's really understanding the depth of our work and being able to um, advocate strongly for the needs of our students. And um, I would say we need uh, more time to articulate what we know, what we breathe, what we live, and what our students um, experience in this journey. Well, thank you so much for um, all of you for sharing that, that piece of advice. I wanna be mindful of the time here. Um, so we hope um, that you were able to see yourself in the amazing work that is happening across California. Um, and we've mentioned throughout the event today um, that a key goal is to make connections with others and hope you know that Stephanie, uh, Peying and Kathleen are now part of, part of your network. So um, we hope that you, you take that um, and, and learn from all their great efforts. Um, so thank you all again for your, your thoughts and for sharing um, what you've been engaging in. With that, I will pass it back to Renee. Thank you so much, Sarah. Again, I wanna say, please keep up the chat, everybody. There's so much happening right now. Um, and we really appreciate all that you're sharing there. Um, now I'm happy to pass it over to Adora Fisher, who's going to, um, Adora's from the Santa Clara County Office of Education, and she's going to lead us through a fishbowl activity. Um, she'll be talking a little bit about what that fishbowl is and then getting into um, um, some introductions of everybody who will be involved in the fishbowl today. So I will hand it over to you, Adora. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to start out by um, talking about um, Santa Clara County and the collaborative or consortium that we're creating amongst our stakeholders by braiding different funding sources um, to create this collaboration, but also to create a uh, workforce UPK workforce teacher pipeline. And that's going to be the basis of um, our conversation today because there are many stakeholders involved and a lot of different needs. Um, I'd like to introduce first the people who are going to be involved in the uh, fishbowl today. That's Associate Dean of Santa Clara University, Marco Bravo, uh, Superintendent Orchard Elementary School, Jeff Bowman, um, Teacher Outreach Coordinator for Carrillo College, Kim Sakamoto, a Region 5 Lead for Expanded Learning Coordinator, Mara Wold. We also have with us today uh, Director Early Learning, Alum Rock School District, Dr. Deanna Ballesteros, and uh, the Director of Early Learning for First Five, Melissa Wong. And I believe um, Esmeralda um, Rosales from director, is the Director of Early Learning as well for First Five will also be joining us. Next slide, please. Santa Clara County is creating this uh, teacher workforce pipeline. And these are the areas that we have looked at. We assess the need. We've gone through that process and looked at the needs of, um, of our county in terms of the teacher workforce. We've done the research. We have pulled the statistics that CDE has provided, as well as gone out to all of our districts and stakeholders to pull their information as well. We've mapped the assets. We have done this portion where we looked at what exists out there in terms of uh, teacher workforce recruitment, what programs exist in terms of supporting um, teachers who are interested in going into early childhood education, what current funding is available. And we update that um, asset map on a regular basis. We are in the process now of developing our partnerships. We currently are working with First Five, Educare and Cadango. We're also working with um, West Ed. We have several community colleges we're working with that are located in Santa Clara County. We also have 31 school districts that have signed on um, in one capacity or another. And we, um, in, in addition to that, have several IHEs that have also been included in this work. We're looking at adding to our partners, our home um, child care providers. We believe that they should not be left out as well as private school care providers as well. So developing our partnerships uh, is an ongoing process. 
We have also started to identify gaps. In uh, other words, identifying the need, but where are the gaps? Where are the funding gaps? Where are the facilities gaps? Where are the education gaps? Where are the gaps in terms of access? Uh, what about diversity and equity and inclusion? Um, there's a lot that needs to be addressed in terms of the building the structure for a workforce pipeline and, and those gaps need to be filled in order for each stakeholder to be able to function at their highest capacity. And then finally, we are in the process of planning and planning is always ongoing and, and iterative. Next slide, please. So our collaborative centers around uh, the County Office of Education, but we are just the conduit, if you will. And we are finding ways to bring together all of the stakeholders in higher education that would be universities as well as community college partnerships, our regional organizations, our early learning providers and our um, our local education agencies. In addition to that, we are applying for every grant that is offered so that we can braid those grants that will support all of our stakeholders in the work that we are going to do to support our youngest and most vulnerable student population. Next slide, please. So establishing a shared vision and mission is, is something that we're currently working on. The questions that are leading us are what candidates, uh, uh, what candidates do in, within the collaboration and who do we wanna target? What characteristics should ideal candidates uh, come to us with? And how can we support those candidates um, from um, getting teaching permits and, and, and high school candidates even getting teaching permits through credentialing and then job placement. So we're looking at the entry level pathways as well as supporting all candidates who enter these pathways through um, job placement. And then after they get placed in a position how, we can, how can we continue to support them at least for a year after placement with coaching and mentoring, um, which is really important in terms of success and retention uh, in, in the education field. Uh, based on the goals of our partners, our collaboration um, our, and, and, and our consortium wants to recruit candidates that can achieve um, ethnic diversity, we're looking at racial and language diversity uh, within the K-12 workforce, and as well as inclusion. Um, and we should not forget inclusion also means those candidates who may have uh, other physical challenges as well. We wanna ensure that the UPK staff have the right experiences and backgrounds to work with our younger children. And the people that, um, that supervise them also have the same understandings and backgrounds as it relates to early childhood education. So in our um, administrative credentialing program, we have included and developed uh, along with the um, Silicon Valley Community Foundation and along with um, other teacher development organizations um, curriculum that addresses uh, leading in schools that have early childhood uh, programs. And that allows us to be able to ensure that administrators who leave our programs with their credential are able to lead uh, early childhood education programs and are able to address the needs of our youngest populations. Next slide, please. So identifying best practices for targeted candidates, I'll let you look at this slide briefly. It's um, ensuring that the cost uh, to candidates is manageable. We are trying our very best to ensure that candidates will go through our workforce pipeline with no debt. Uh, it's key for candidates of color 
to receive credentials and be placed in positions and not have the debt hanging over their heads so that they can begin to create general wealth, ge generational wealth for their, um, for their families and their future generations. Uh, we will have career counselors who will help navigate, help uh, participants navigate systems. We will provide mentors and coaches for um, our participants as soon as they enter and include coaching to a year after they've been placed in a job. So that means some of our people will be uh, provided coaches for five to six years. Um, and hopefully, hopefully establishing good relationships that can support them throughout their profession. Our plan is to have our um, candidates go through these processes in cohorts and uh, cohorts of ELs that um, can be addressed in higher ed classes that are taught in their native language. Additional wraparound services will pro be provided, uh, such as childcare. Um, assistance programs. Uh, classes will be offered uh, during flexible hours so that candidates can continue to work because we know in Silicon Valley, people can't just um, quit their jobs and go to school. Stipends are also being provided um, uh, upon completion of certain benchmarks. And then um, reasonable pay payback requirements are put in place not payback in terms of um, finances, but payback in terms of time, so that they will make a commitment to the districts that hire them, that they will stay with those, those uh, districts four years after having been placed in that district. So those districts can now, or early childhood education programs as well, can count on those employees for four years after th their initial placement. Next slide, please. And so when we look at a, a pipeline, we want to also consider that it, within this pipeline, there is a lattice that we can look at. And within that lattice, we can see the matric matriculation opportunities from one rung of the lattice to the next. And there is flexibility for entry points um, and pathways within the lattice like instructional, um, for instructional aides and paraeducators. Their pathways may look very different for those who come into the lattice with a BA. Um, we're also looking within the lattice to ensure that uh, with, along each step, there is funding that aligns with that particular pathway. So once again, that once a person enters the program and they leave the program, they leave the workforce pipeline with no debt. And that is, is uh, an initial goal. I'd like to move from um, here, I believe this is our last slide, to bringing our um, uh, fishbowl discussion together. If we could uh, eliminate the slide deck, thank you very much. And those people who are involved in the fishbowl again today are Dr. Marco Bravo, Kim Sakamoto, Heidi Emberling, Esmer Esmeralda Rosales, Melissa Hong, Dr. Jeff Bowman, Dr. Deanna Ballesteros, and Mara Wold. And I'd like our panel to start thinking about and discussing the following um, question. How might a collaborative consortium within Santa Clara County fulfill the need of a UPK workforce from your particular organization's perspective? And I'd really like to start with our school districts, because I think in, in these webinars and seminars, we often overlook the elephant in the room, which is the school district and the local education agency that either is running a TK program or contracting out a TK program and then has to transition those students into their regular um, kindergarten through eighth grade or 12th grade uh, programs. So Jeff, if you could start out with, what does a UPK pipeline mean for Orchard and, and what supports do you need? Sure, and, and good afternoon to everyone. You know, it's always great hearing what others are doing and, and having this conversation for us being a small school district in Santa Clara County. 
you know, we face a lot of challenges from growing our own, but also keeping our own. So part of the, what this pipeline does is having that continuity on our site, um, being able to offer a full day, having uh, colleagues within the county support it when you may only have, you know, two classes or three classes on a campus versus others in the county that might be able to run 10 or 12 classes. And we're not able to pr provide that collegiality across. And so having this pipeline where you can bring people on, you provide that ongoing counseling and mentoring, um, it's gonna help them stay in, in that orchard, but also more importantly, stay in our county serving our students. Um, and then the other piece of it that, that is exciting for us is to be able to have that, that condition in there where somebody gets to come in, they get to become part of our school coach culture for three to four years. Um, we think they'll stay longer than that too once they have a chance to be here. But certainly when you're competing against some of the highest funded school districts in the state, being a small district, we need programs like this to, to grow and, and have people become part of our community. Thank you, Jeff. Um, uh, Dr. Ballesteros, could you jump in? Dr. Ballesteros is from Alum Rock and they run an early learning program. So how would a UPK pipeline help support your programs, Dr. So for us, um, I think one of hi everybody, nice to see everyone and um, thank you. Um, for the invitation to be here and talk about Alum Rock School District. So for us, um, we began our early learning initiative in 2015-16. So we've had our four-year-olds, you know, in our TK room since then. In Alum Rock, we call them T4s, but it has been a struggle. So having this consortium is really, really helpful that you have other people that you can talk with to support, you know, the challenges, the gaps that you talk about that we're doing, because we do, um, especially coming back from the pandemic, one of the biggest priorities I think that we need to do is really take care of our educators, take care of our families and teachers. So that wellness is the big priority for us in, in Alum Rock. And as we're talking about the teachers and the standards and everything, I think we really need to relook at that and put that social emotional wellness at the top of this. You know, how do we do this? How do we support families in this wellness? The consortium is the rich part of having more than just the district and, and um, having additional leadership and administrators that even if it's just thought partners, you can call and talk to each other if you're having these challenges, these gaps that are happening um, for us in, in the Alum Rock district. I mean, one example is declining enrollment, right? What do, we, what do we do when we see declining enrollment? And I think one of the things that we've looked at is how do we repurpose um, buildings, facility, classrooms to really embrace and engage what is going on now. Um, I think that's one of it. Did I get it all? Yeah, I think so. The wellness factor, I think for me, is a biggie that, you know, and I know that there's been some research, research telling us that this pandemic effect is going to stay with us five um, to 10 years. And so, um, you know, embracing the care of everybody in the district, um, everybody in the county, everybody uh, in the world, I think is, is a big priority. And so um, um, Mara and Marco and Daphne, Esmeralda um, and Melissa, please jump on. I would like to um, talk about the, um, the importance of partnership and how, we were able to come to this point um, where historically investments have been made to early educators through uh, the early child education system like the Quality Counts California or Quality Matters, where we've had a bachelor's cohort program with San Jose State University or the master's cohort program with Pacific Oaks College. And leveraging those existing relationships to solidify a pipeline um, is sort of the culminating result of the, the um, pilot programs that had um, started in the past. Um, but I, I would say that first five uh, voice in terms of this conversation will be in um, helping folks understand that the career lattice that we're envisioning um, allows for flexibility in career development. And while it is beneficial for individual educators to see higher 
um, salaries, union protected jobs through school district. There are also other opportunities as well for family child care providers who want to remain as a family child care home businesses or become a coach. Um, and that um, that other educational opportunities are offered where they can see lateral movements as well as diagonal movements in the career of Lattice so that we can continue to engage in, um, in you know, highly uh, motivated professionals uh, in the ECE field. Um, as, as we have a consortium, a collaborative co consortium in Santa Clara County, um, I think one of the important things that um, we need to address is that teachers, when teachers enter TK positions, that's not the end of the, the goal, that we, we continue to support TK, TK teachers where they feel uh, supported by leadership within the school districts to implement developmentally appropriate learning opportunities, um, where we recognize that play is fundamentally important uh, skill that um, allows children to develop problem solving, collaboration, and creativity. Um, and that especially the BIPOC early educators who are entering TK classrooms continue to be successful and offer high quality early learning uh, experiences um, just because uh, historically, you know, supporting schools so that they're prepared to set BIPOC early educators uh, for successes, I think it's just another important thing because um, uh, it's just another layer of complication where we wanna create a culturally welcoming environment for uh, BIPOC teachers. Um, I think you bring up a good point, Melissa, yeah. and especially as it relates to ensuring that um, the training is there for the mm -hmm. teachers and the understanding yeah. of the difference between PK3 education right yeah. and fourth grade through 12th grade education um I, i'd like to bring in uh our higher ed folks to to comment on that and and what does that training look like or mean to higher education because that's really important and is a little different than what we're doing right now daphne and marco would you like to add to that yes uh, certainly i think that um I'd like to make one uh, point uh, here uh, before we kind of move into that question, Adora. I think for Santa Clara University as a, a private institution, it is often sort of thought of um, as a partner, perhaps that might be too too expensive. Um, yet we are we could be really a great partner for um, districts for schools. We have a couple of programs that um, pipeline programs that I think are in vast need of support and partnerships, stronger partnerships with our, our, our county office and so forth. Um, you know, one of them is a future teachers project where we um, recruit high school students to help uh, to sort of lead them into a career path of education. Uh, we fully fund them through their undergraduate program at Santa Clara University. We fully fund them through their teacher credentialing program here at Santa Clara University. And yet at times we have like 20 slots for the scholarships, we have challenges filling those slots. And I think uh, uh, partnering, uh, sort of stronger partnerships with our LEAs would really sort of address that particular issue. Um, you know, we're, we're uh, starting another program where we are working with now with the Santa Clara County Office of Ed to um, sort of recruit classified staff that want to move in the direction of a teacher credentialing program, offering them an opportunity to complete their bachelor's degree online in an asynchronous platform with one of our partner universities, and then would be able to come to Santa Clara University to complete their, um, their teaching credential, and then hopefully be interns and be able to move into the classroom very quickly, sort of using a lot of their expertise. And you know, this program is also, we're working very hard to make it um, uh, as affordable to students as possible so that they, as Adora mentioned, that they leave without any debt um, from these, the, you know, getting their bachelor's degree on their credential. It's very hard to sort of live in the Bay Area um, and also have sort of debt from, uh, uh, you know, your education. So we, we try to sort of eliminate that as much as possible. I do sort of think that uh, what you mentioned, Adora, with respect to the type of education that um, 
is going to be necessary is to really sort of rethink a little bit about um, who our students are in our teacher credentialing program, thinking about sort of the, the vast experience that a lot of these students are going to bring. They're not going to be your you know, 22, 23 year old undergraduate students that come to you uh, from undergrad that are moving into these positions that there, I believe there's going to be a, 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 a major sort of uh, shift in terms of the student population in these particular degrees. And so an understanding of adult learning, I think is going to be necessary for our uh, teacher educators to really sort of understand how to uh, converse and, and pull from the vast um, experiences that these students are going to bring to the classroom. Thank you, Marco. And Daphne, what are your thoughts uh, coming from Cabrillo College? Trying to unmute. Um, I would agree with uh, all of the panelists and so much of what I've heard today. It's it's uh, heartening to me to see everyone come together, these innovative ideas and this great expertise. And so it does make me excited uh, with a little bit of trepidation because I think we also all know the, um, the constraints uh, challenges that come along with building these pathways, but um, I do believe that we have the partnership, we are moving in the right direction, and um, is, and I agree with what um, Kathleen was saying about um, students, uh, the students are there, we just need to provide the supports uh, supports for them at every level. And when Melissa was speaking, I thought about that notion, that early childhood notion of um, continuity of care continuity of care that moves across the, the lifespan for all learners. And so um, keeping that in mind, I think we have, um, it can be a guide, um, a guidepost for us. Exactly. I think the, the, the consortium, as, as we come together with, with the similar goals, right, will provide um, that continuity. And, and we can have discussions about that continuity and what it looks like. Right, not only what it looks like, but how it's implemented, which is even more important. Um, in addition to uh, higher ed and LEAs, we also have brought in expanded learning and looked at after school care. And so, Mara, I want to make sure that you jump in here and talk about the consortium in relation to uh, after school and expanded learning. Thank you, Adora. Hello, everybody. Um, again, I'm Mara. I'm with technically with the Monterey County Office of Education, but I provide technical support to all of our publicly funded expanded learning programs. So I feel like I'm among kindred spirits here because ECE and expanded learning have both been um, worlds where we've had shortages of staff. We have low pay typically. Um, we share a lot in common. And so um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be a collaborative thought partner with all of you um, because we're facing some of the same challenges you are with, with recruitment and retention. Um, and many of you have probably heard of the massive expansion in our field of after school and summer with the expanded learning opportunity program dollars that are now available statewide um, has just exacerbated the staff shortage issue that we have. And so relative to workforce development, I think um, I'm really excited to sort of think outside the box a little bit about how we see expanded learning in relationship to uh, receiving credentials, et cetera. And I, I speak from the heart when I say that I've had uh, a leader who was one of my daughter's favorite leaders in her after school program who had to leave uh, ex her work in expanded learning because she was at that point in her teacher credentialing program where her hours didn't count. And that sort of lit a fire under me about, wow, this is a missed opportunity here because this young woman was bringing in all of the strategies that she was learning in her coursework and was working with a group of 20 students and was actually executing everything that she was learning in, in essence in, in her job. Um, so I would love to see um, some additional conversations and connections made potentially to the expanded learning world and seeing how it could almost act as a learning lab type of situation, which um, would be a phenomenal opportunity for those who are on their, their teacher preparation um, pathways to actually be able to work with students in a in a classroom type setting, try on those strategies, 
while they're actually earning um, a respectable pay. So I, um, I'm, I'm here hopefully with that. Um, that offering is in terms of a partnership statewide with our expanded learning uh, field. We, um, we certainly are here in, in terms of supporting the entire teacher workforce and pipeline efforts. And we are doing our own work too, by the way, just um, in terms of the older youth. So, you know, ECE is a world where we're with the P3, we obviously have some overlap. And then just know that expanded learning covers also fourth through 12th grade. So it is imperative that we come together, work together, more closely on how we can support each other in this pipeline. I'd like to really thank you all for your input because um, I think what- Adora, what we, yeah. sorry, this is Esmeralda. I just also wanted to include that. I know that we're all um, thinking at the P3 uh, portion as well. And I know that um, <clears throat> the first five has also started this apprenticeship with early learning workforce pathway, which is a launching in the fall. And this is kind of, uh, kind of, at the beginning, kind of backfilling on the workforce pipeline, which is the entry level for an associate's permit, um, which they'll be working in a um, in two different cohorts in a center based and in a family child care provider site. So these are some of the, the ways that we are also kind of thinking ahead that they might start here, but in the long run for those who are going to be eventually retiring or moving, this is a great way as well as those to keep those interested in the field of child development and eventually becoming teachers, uh, P3 um, to three teachers. Right. I think and you're so right, Esmeralda. I think what we what we're learning is there's space in this in this um, pipeline for all age groups. Yes, and, <laughs> and there's opportunity for all age groups as well. And and as we can also see that each stakeholder brings a different perspective, right? So the consortium is even more important because we're building the pipeline, but we're also building the connections where, for example, Orchard School District might look at first five and say, hey, first five, can you help me out with this? Or we might have Marco say, well, we've got these programs that are completely paid for. Can we start to look at after school care providers and maybe as classified staff, they can join these programs and end up with a BA debt free. So bringing all of these ideas and thoughts and processes together through a consortium, I think is what Santa Clara County is, is attempting to do. And, and I really appreciate um, all of the panel and the fishbowl participants for bringing those ideas to the larger group. These discussions will continue and we look forward to all of you joining us at uh, future dates. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody. This was absolutely wonderful. And as somebody who, when I went to college, I was given, I, I, I came from a single parent household um, and I was given $500 and I was told good luck. And I have a wonderful support system in my family, but I've been paying loans for 25 years for my three uh, degrees that I have. And so I love when people are talking about um, helping our students to live de debt free. My husband and I, we call our loan, um, our school loans, our second mortgage, um, because that's how much it is each month. And so um, thank you so much for this fishbowl and all this conversation. And I really want to give a shout out also to all of our speakers here, but also to everybody who's engaging in the chat. As we know, a fishbowl is really about like kind of a different way of watching people as they're having a conversation and we're listening, but we're simultaneously, you know, making comments and asking questions within the chat and just seeing everybody engage. And that was really, really exciting. Um, so we're going to go ahead now and transition to Peach. P uh, Denise Kennedy is going to be speaking with us for a few minutes. And then after Denise speaks with us, we're going to break into our second regional breakout group. I want to let everybody know that this regional breakout group is going to last about 25 minutes, but it took us a couple minutes to transition everybody over. So um, um, I'm excited for Denise to talk with us a little bit about Peach, and then we'll go ahead into our second breakout today. So Denise Kennedy, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks so much, Renee. And first, I just wanted to commend and thank Adora and the uh, Santa Clara County Collaborative. I think this is an excellent model for our state to get everyone together from the County Office of Ed, include superintendents, uh, school districts, higher ed, as well as the current workforce. I think that is an ideal model. And I hope that others on this call that are not in 
Santa Clara County can, can work towards that. Um, one of the things that I wanted, there, there's a lot I want to say, I have five minutes. So first, um, with TK, um, I created the TK certificate that's at the University of Laverne. It's post bac master's level, and it is curriculum-based, which I just want to highlight. 24 units of basic coursework is not enough. We need higher ed curriculum-based coursework. It's really important to highlight that for the, the workforce and TK. The other thing I wanted to say, in, in Los Angeles County, we worked with uh, the uh, Workforce Pathways Los Angeles, Child360, who is no longer with us, and Peach, and we created a career lattice as um, Adora kind of presented and we went so far as to involve all of the higher ed in LA County Community College, CSUs, privates. And we found where are the courses being taught in Spanish? Where are the weekend courses? Where are the evening courses? So that friends and families and neighbors and family child care, all the way up through a PhD program, we created a lattice with every re resource. And I hope that other counties can do the same. The other thing I wanted to mention is that I'm part of the Uplift California grant. And this is a very collaborative um, grant that we've been working on. There's three CSUs, five community colleges, and we also have our community partners. At Cal Poly Pomona, we're working with Baldwin Park Unified School District and our community college feeder schools. Together, collaboratively, we're creating a uh, dual language learner competencies for our teacher candidates. And again, this goes to our teacher preparation for our dual immersion classrooms or in competencies for our teachers that we are preparing to go out into the workforce. Right now, we're in the process of actually creating an observation tool to assess those teachers in their practicums, whether they're in a preschool classroom all the way up through third grade, because our program at Cal Poly Pomona is birth through eight, and we have students placed all across the board. This is why it's so important to highlight a child development or early childhood baccalaureate degree, because those students or candidates, if you will, are being placed in classrooms. And having that experience is so valuable. So the collaboration that we're working on with our school district also, and asking them what do they need from us in higher ed to get the students ready to go once they graduate. Obviously this PK credential is post back, meaning that after they, they go through us, they currently they go and get a multiple subject credential because there is no PK three credential, um, but that would be the ideal. So I just wanna commend and thank everyone we can all work together um, as teacher preparation and focus should be again on child development and child and family centered and maintaining that strong developmentally appropriate instructional practice that we know we do in ECE. So I'll pass it back over Renee, thank you. Thank you so much, Denise. I'm really excited now. We are gonna go in, back into our breakout groups. For those of you that weren't here earlier, um, just uh, just a FYI, we're breaking into breakout groups based on our regions. And so if you could check out the um, regional map we have listed right now and see where you're located, um, when we go to breakouts, that will be based on that. We are combining region one and region two because we um, they were a little small the first round. We wanna make sure there's a lot of collaboration happening and a lot of connectivities. Oh, I actually see that the updates are in the chat right now. So if you have a chance to please check that out, that would be great. As we get into these breakouts, we're gonna have 25 minutes. Um, uh, or it'll be a little bit shorter just because of the transition time, but we really want to be thinking about what are we already doing in the region to support a well-qualified ECE workforce and what might a productive regional collaboration like look like? What would it entail? What are our actionable next steps? And there's a couple resources you're going to be using while you're in this breakout. 
Um, first off, we have a crowdsource Padlet that is filled with lots of resources and we hope everyone will continue to contribute to this. Um, and this is like an, an open source resource that we would like everybody to have. We also have a Google contact list and um, we really wanted everybody in the first breakout to, to do those introductions and get to know each other a little bit better. And in the second breakout, it's like, let's get everybody's contact information. So that way, this is the beginning of the collaboration. And many of you are probably already collaborating with the people that you're talking with in your region. We're just so hopeful that there's some new people that you haven't met before, that when you leave the event today, you're going to have new colleagues within your region, new partners within your region. So within, um, within this next discussion, please know we are asking for people to add to the Padlet. We will have the Padlet. Um, we've got the prompts in the, in the chat now. We'll have the Padlet in, in, uh, excuse me, instructions in the chat when we transition. If you need any help with the Padlet, let us know. And um, we will be coming back together at 350. And at that time, we'll be looking at a third Padlet, which is our next steps Padlet. But for now, let's go ahead and transition into our groups. Um, and uh, any other comments or anything, Hannah, before we move? Are we good? No, just um, some of the groups have um, shrunk. So if you do feel like your group has decided that you'd like to join another region, please do feel free to move there. Um, do what makes sense for you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Hannah. And thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful time in the second breakout. Okay, I see people are starting to come back out of their breakout rooms. Let's just wait another minute until everybody is able to come back together in our full group. Um, as we're waiting for everybody to return, let's start thinking about like, what's the one step or what is a step that you can take next? So a step that you're thinking about taking next, we have 43 back so far. I know there's more that are coming. So just be thinking that way. We also are, um, oh, I love, I love watching the chat. Thanks Dion for putting that for uh, region 11. That's great. Um, such a nice warm feeling to have that collaboration. Um, and we're, uh, as we're waiting for everybody to return, um, we're also going to be sharing a Google sheet that some of you have already seen. I've already started to add your contact information to. I want to let everybody know that on that Google sheet at the bottom, there's actually a tab for every single individual region. So you can specifically put yourself directly in your region with all that contact information. Okay, great. It looks like we're all back. We have about 179 of us here together, which is so exciting right now. I hope your session together was worthwhile. I'm excited to see what people have already started to put on the Padlet um, and just really be thinking about what is the one next step that you are planning to take. So I'm going to share my screen now for just a moment so we can have a chance to look at um, what our next steps might be. So, um, I, and if you haven't had a chance to contribute to this yet, please, please, please do. All of these um, documents are going to be like living, breathing documents, and we want to keep them going. Also want to note to everybody that in the chat, we're going to put the, the Google document as well. Please make sure you add your regional contact information. I know some people added it on the front page, but we actually have tabs at the bottom for every individual region. So if you could please move yourself like kind of where you should be, that would be great. I love when I'm looking at these next steps right here. Let me reload, see if there's any more coming. Um, when we're looking at the, the next steps, I appreciate just the first one I see from the region one, I think is so important. We need one pathway. It can't be too confusing. I know when I've been in other spaces over the past um, few months now, that's one of the number one things we're hearing. We need clear, consistent communication and who's going to be sharing that information with our students, depending on which, which level of students that you're working with or which age of students that you're working with. We're also on our next steps here. We're looking at funding for regional collaboration. Interesting too, that they're sharing like tips here, like private co colleges have some more flexibility. Um, look at all these great, great, great different ideas. So we really, really need to continue to build this next steps Padlet because we're hoping that this is going to be a catalyst for everybody. We're hoping this is almost like a, a sheet where you're going to go, oh my gosh, I didn't think about doing that. And that's what I need to do is my next step. So please make sure you contribute to that more because we want to keep that conversation going. I also am going to do another plug for that Google form because we really want to make sure that when you leave here, we want to make sure that you're going to have this paper of here's who's in your region and here's who I can communicate with directly. Um, and I know many of you are already working together. It's a chance to expand your ecosystem of the groups that you are working with. So with that, I'm so excited that this conversation like today, I know we're not closing quite yet. 
but I, this is not the end. And that's really, really important for everybody to note. This is the beginning of more conversation, the beginning of additional spaces that we will be coming together and, and talking and working and collaborating moving forward. Um, okay, I see there's some glitches with the Google form. So just give us a minute and we will be working on that in a minute. Um, we have quite a few people who were able to get in. So let me see what we can do to make that happen. Um, I also want to um, make sure that we have enough time right now to hear from Karen Escalante from CCTE again. So Karen, thank you so much. We appreciate you being here today and your collaboration, your partnership. Thank you, Renee. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone. It's been it's been such a joy to, to spend the last several hours with you and so many voices, so much knowledge. Um, one of the things that, that really stuck with me, especially um, as, as a representative of the um, California Council on Teacher Education, were the comments that Adora Fisher made in regards to accessibility. When we think about teachers entering the profession. We want to make sure that they are being paid, that, that we have representation from racially linguistic, racially linguistically diverse candidates entering the profession and that they represent the students whom they are serving. And so as we look at adding this additional credential, we do want to make sure that we're providing accessible pathways and that there's flexibility to allow for the, the individuals who are currently in the um, early childhood positions to receive this credential. So I hope today has been a wonderful opportunity for you to reflect on where you are in your learnings. I know this poll that we did at the beginning allowed us to really identify our understandings thus far. I know I was in really that, that newbie category and I'm continuing to learn like many of you. We hope that you were able to strengthen some of these connections and start identifying these regional collaborations that you might be able to um, enforce, um, support, identify, et cetera. We do need to work together. As Renee has said, we have some resources available. We have this Padlet um, where we, each region has been able to contribute. We also have the Padlet with each of the co-sponsors where resources are available to um, who, what organizations are supporting this work and these endeavors here in California. Each of these organizations are part of the ecosystem, as are all of you. Your voices and your knowledge all contribute to this ecosystem. We know that community colleges have been doing this work, and we are so grateful to the amazing work that they have been doing. They have been, been preparing early childhood education teachers for a long time and providing this solid foundation. So many, many thanks to our, to our community college partners. Partners. Many thanks. We know that um, our early childhood, our child development baccalaureate programs are essential in this development as well. Um, we know that we need to build on the skills, the knowledge, dispositions, pedagogical skills for our early childhood educational candidates. Credential programs, that's me, that's where I come in. We know that we need to work with our community college partners and our baccalaureate co colleagues to develop the expertise and our pedagogical expertise for the PK through three credential specialists. We all contribute to this conversation and it's been such a joy to hear from all of you today, the fishbowl opportunities, the experts, the um, CTC, et cetera. And so um, I hope that we can each contribute and continue to partner as we collaborate moving forward. So I'm going to pass it back to Renee and thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Karen, especially I'm just, I've been in the community college system for 15 years. Thank you for acknowledging the work that we do and the expertise from our system. It's greatly appreciated. Um, and I'm gonna hand it over to, to Laurel Doyle now, who's gonna talk for a minute about Tri-C ECE. One thing I want, I'm gonna plug this to everybody. If you're not in PEACH or Tri-C ECE or CCTE or these organizations like join CESA, like join these different groups. That's, that's one of the reasons that they're co-sponsoring. So um, Laurel, I'll hand it over to you for a few minutes and then we'll get ready to close out for the day. Um, thank you so much, Renee. So my name is Laurel Doyle. I am president of Tracy ECE. And just to kind of make this very brief, we are a dynamic voice for early childhood education and for the workforce development. Um, we have 
done a number of things over the years, including um, working with the CTC and um, collaborating on some of our permits and credentials. And we really hope to continue on with that collaboration so that way we can have best practices for young children. Um, I just wanna plug uh, one of the things that we think would really help is to have cap aligned coursework. Uh, reason being is that there's some kind of standardized system around the state and that we could then go back into CAP and ensure maybe we could add TPEs into there. We can define what play-based education is. Um, there's a social emotional component. So that, that way it kind of standardizes. That's just like one of many ideas that we have. And we hope that um, if you are a prospective member, so you work at a lab school or at um, as an ECE or child development faculty at a community college that you'll please join us. And I'll go ahead and put, um, put Sandra Moe's contact information again in chat and we hope to see you all again soon. And we look forward to collaborating with you. Thank you so much, Laurel. I have one slide to share with everybody super quick before we officially wrap for the day. And it's an invitation. Um, it's an invitation to come together more in an, in an additional space. Um, I wanna let everybody know that um, We've identified the need to have shared language across systems and with what we're doing right now. And we really understand that um, um, we need to all come together in order to do that. So we have created a work group. Um, it's called the Common Language Crosswalk. And we're literally, or sorry, um, it's the Community of Practice, the Bridging Child Development and Education Community of Practice. But we're on a document right now called the Common Language Crosswalk. And we're literally taking terms from early childhood education and terms from K-12 education and trying to make it have shared language. And so I just want to like open it up to anybody who's interested. We're going to put a link in the chat if you'd like to join the work group. Right now we're meeting every Thursday Pacific time 1.30 to 2.30. Um, uh, if you're available, you can pop in anytime. And so please, if you're interested, click on the link for the um, for the for the um, the form and you can fill out your information and then we will make sure that you're part of this group. If anybody has any questions, please reach out to me, education at reneemarshall.com or Rachel Johnson, who's the lead of this community of practice. Rachel's coming out of Ventura College. Both of our emails are at the bottom of this slide. Um, we so appreciate you being here. This is really about bridging and coming together and collaboration and connectivity and honestly just humanity it's about the children and families of california and we appreciate everybody so much and i'm gonna before kathy gives final comment i want to say one more thing too we'll have a survey coming out and we need to actually we're putting it out i believe in the chat please complete it as soon as possible we are going to go ahead and um do a couple uh, gift cards. I purchased a couple gift cards, little incentive for that survey. And so we'll do a wheel of names in a few days and uh, and give a couple gift cards out to people. I'm thinking Amazon, if somebody has something, a better idea, let me know. I know those are easy to email, but um, we want to appreciate you for taking the time to be here and for being involved in the survey, which is gonna just help us moving forward. So with that, Nicole, uh, or actually let me hand it over to Kathy for our final comments for today. Thanks, Renee. Um, we just like to thank everyone for your engagement today, especially going into a holiday weekend. Um, and we hope that you found today's event worthwhile um, and that you were able to make some connections today. So thank you so much. We, we really appreciate you all attending.